Okay, this is an admonition for the record. You are going to have to speak up, okay? When you direct your answer, direct them more to the young lady on your right as opposed to me, okay? I am sure that your attorney has explained to you why we are here. Now I'm going to take your deposition, which is a statement under oath. She, that young lady there, who is the court reporter, is writing down on that machine that she has in front of her, and it is going to be transcribed into a booklet, and this booklet is called your deposition. You are under oath, and that is the same oath you would take if you were in front of a judge and a jury. It is the oath to tell the truth, which I'm sure you will do. I don't want you to answer any of my questions that you don't understand. Very often, attorneys get a little bit long-winded and get carried away with themselves, and we ask questions that we don't understand and we expect somebody else to get it. So if you don't understand a question, tell me you don't understand it, and I will rephrase it or re-ask it in a way so that you and I can communicate. Don't guess at anything. I am going to ask questions about how many times you went to the doctor and how many days you were off work. You don't have to give me exact answers, but I am entitled to your best approximation. I don't want pure guesses. If you have no idea, tell me you don't remember. Tell me what is not clear. Have you understood everything I have said so far? Okay, this is a motion, a motion to strike for the record. Your Honor, the respondent has submitted to the court the expert report of Dr. Whitaker, one of the respondents who may testify. The report consists of 112 pages of out-of-court statements along with additional hearsay exhibits. Respondent assures the court and counsel that it is not proffering this report into evidence at this time, but is instead merely providing it to the court as a reference. The submission, Your Honor, of this report as a reference rather than evidence is highly prejudicial and therefore the report should be stricken. In the first instance, the content of Dr. Whitaker's hearsay report as a reference is unduly prejudicial in the instant proceedings. In the second instance, the submission of Dr. Whitaker's hearsay report will be unduly prejudicial in any consideration of the record in this case, should there be an appeal. An expert report that is being proffered is hearsay. Therefore, it should be properly excluded from the record. We move to strike the submission of the expert report at this time. Okay, this is a short stipulation for the record. Applicant's attorney agrees to accept $200 as a reasonable labor code section 6780 fee. Stipulate to relieve the court reporter of her duties under the code of civil procedure so that the applicant may sign the deposition transcript under the penalty of perjury. The original deposition transcript will be lodged in the custody of applicant's attorney to be made available at the time of the trial. An unsigned copy of the deposition transcript may be used as a fully executed original if no fully executed original is made available at the time of trial. Any changes or corrections to this applicant's deposition testimony will be brought to the attention of defense attorneys within 30 days 
of any potential trial date so stipulated. Okay, this is some jury charge material for the record. These people had no doubt there was something major wrong. What did they do? They did the only thing that I could imagine that we could expect anybody to do. They did something a lot of people wouldn't have done. They sort of got involved and sort of stuck their necks out. There are not many people who do that nowadays. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, they got in front of Mr. Farrell and they forced him to stop his car. In fact, they even forced him to pull over and stop his car. Ricardo Sanchez gets out and Mr. Farrell is putting it in gear and starting to drive away again. Mr. Sanchez then yells and whistles and manages to get Mr. Farrell to come to a stop. Now, Ricardo Sanchez told Mr. Farrell, you better stop and sleep it off, man. Again, he said, you better stop and sleep it off, man. You've had too much to drink to drive or something like that. In fact, Mr. Sanchez, if you will recall, was not real excited about overplaying how he thought that Mr. Farrell was drunk. He said he knew something was wrong with him. Holly Baker talked about, well, yeah, she could see him. He was untidy, slurred speech, red watery eyes, and other symptoms of intoxication, too. She thought he was drunk. It is clear that Mr. Sanchez saw Mr. Farrell was drunk as well, but I don't think he wanted to kick any dirt on top of the guy. He just said something was wrong with the guy. I told him to stop and sleep it off. We know that Mr. Farrell said, I agree with you, and he agreed to stop and sleep. We know that is true. We know that is true, not just because Mr. Sanchez's recollection, but we know that this statement was corroborated by the defendant's own statement to Officer Plummer. We know that after the collision, Officer Plummer arrested Mr. Farrell, gave him his Miranda rights, and interviewed him. We know that Mr. Farrell stated to Officer Plummer that he was pulled over by somebody and that person told him he had had too much to drink and he had admitted that he acknowledged to that person that he knew he shouldn't have been driving and acknowledged that he would sleep it off. So in other words, once again, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we have Mr. Farrell acknowledging that the act was performed with the knowledge of the danger involved. He had knowledge of the danger. He knew he had no business driving that car, and he knew the reason why was because he had been drinking. He knew the reason why is because it is dangerous to drink and drive, and he knew the danger. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it doesn't talk about danger to something. It talks about that it is dangerous to drink and drive and the danger is to human life. Ladies and gentlemen, the danger is to human life and Mr. Farrell did not seem to care. How else do we know? How do we know that? How else is it that we've proven that Mr. Farrell was aware of the danger of his actions and putting other people at great risk? Because of his own admonition, we know this and we know about Mr. Farrell's driving record in the state of Nevada. Back to some documentary evidence here, okay? You're going to have Exhibit 2, which has been marked and admitted into evidence, and you'll get a chance to look at that. That is a 2005 docket regarding a conviction in the county of Clark in Nevada. You'll see it when you get it. It is a conviction in 2005 for driving under the influence, okay? There's another one from the same county, and that is even earlier in 2002, I believe. You'll be able to get that information off of Exhibit 4. Exhibit 4 is Mr. Farrell's driving record from the state of Nevada. So you'll get a chance to see that he had two convictions in the state of Nevada, prior to what we're talking about here in this case. Now, how do you know that that is Mr. Farrell? 
Well, remember now, his honor in reading the instructions said that things are stipulated to that you can accept them as true. Well, we had a stipulation, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, between the parties, that exhibit numbers 13 and 14 could be admitted into evidence as being the booking sheets of the Blythe County Police Department and the California Highway Patrol, respectively. That's 13 and 14. Now, the reason why I wanted those in is so that you can take those and you can see from that information that he gave to the booking officer about his name, his date of birth, his height and weight, his social security number, and all of that comports exactly with information that's going to be on the form that you're going to look at in exhibit four. So there's not a question that maybe we're looking at the wrong guy here. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Mr. Farrell is the same individual. You'll have those in the jury room to go back and compare it. It is just like fingerprints. Nobody in any case says, ladies and gentlemen, you can accept that as true. These fingerprints from the fingerprints rolled at the station and these fingerprints are from the stolen gun or whatever. They're the same. You take those back there and you look at them. This is the same kind of evidence you use whenever you try to compare if this is the same person. Next, look at exhibit six. Exhibit six is a history of the contacts Mr. Farrell has had with the Central Nevada Safety Council. That's the organization that gave Mr. Farrell his first DUI program, his first substance abuse program. That's what they call it. This is where you're trained about not drinking and driving. Incidentally, you'll be able to see that there is a lot of information in that packet. You'll be able to look at it back there and see what all is in there. There is a lot of interesting things there. Ladies and gentlemen, the other thing you're going to see that was regarding his first DUI in Nevada is that after the second DUI in Nevada, they assigned him to the second offender DUI school. That is an important fact. We know that Mr. Farrell went to the first offender program. The reason why we know that is because not only is it in the documents you're now looking at, but also because Plummer's testimony about his statements, that is Mr. Farrell's statements under Miranda, he stated that he had been to the school and he had learned, well, not really. He didn't say he learned anything. He said he had been to the school. He said he listened to lectures and he said he had seen films also about the dangers of drinking and driving. With respect to the second offender class, you'll see that in packet number six, there is notification from the Central Nevada Safety Council to the court advising the court that Mr. Farrell had not followed its orders in completing the second offender driving program. And that is also more or less consistent with Mr. Farrell's statements to Officer Plummer whenever he said that he considered those classes, those programs, a waste of his precious time. Finally, you will remember that we're not only talking about the necessary mental state. Right now, we're talking about implied malice. How have we proven it? Look at the testimony of Debbie Fong. Debbie Fong came up from Wilmington. She testified that back in May, a few months before the fatal accident back in May, Debbie Fong was driving a car near her house in Wilmington. She got rear-ended. She saw a car behind her that was driving in an erratic manner. She got her car rear-ended and she got out. And what does she find herself confronted with? Mr. Farrell getting out of his car. Well, I believe that Ms. Fong asked the defendant for information such as a driver's license and registration. Mr. Farrell didn't want to give it. He said there's no reason for something like that. He did not give it. What did Ms. Fong say to Mr. Farrell? She testified that she said, I can smell the odor of alcohol on you. You are a danger on the highway. Stop driving. Stop driving or I'll call 911. Mr. Farrell had plenty of chances. 
Mr. Farrell had been told many times. Mr. Farrell has no reason not to know that his act, driving under the influence, that it is true and bona fide danger to human life. What did Mr. Farrell do? Mr. Farrell at that time got up. Then he got back in his car saying, I don't have to stay here to listen to this. And off he drove. He drove away, leaving Miss Fong there at the curb on the highway, watching him drive away. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I think that pretty much sums up Mr. Farrell's attitude about driving under the influence. I don't have to stay here and listen to this. I want to do what I want to do, regardless of the consequences or the threat to human life. Some people talked about the responsibility that they think that each person has. You can drink and drive if you want to, but you've got to bear the responsibility. Mr. Farrell should have stayed there and listened to Debbie Fong, but he chose not to. Mr. Farrell could have said to himself, it is true that drinking and driving is going to get me in some serious trouble someday. I just hit another car with my car. Everybody knows how dangerous that could have been. He could have done that, but he didn't. Mr. Farrell is aware of the danger. Somewhere inside Mr. Farrell's head, he is probably hearing a little voice saying, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this. Drinking and driving is going to get you in trouble. It is dangerous, it is dangerous to human life, and you know that somebody can get killed. But the thing is that Mr. Farrell can just turn that little voice in his head off, just like he turned off Debbie Fong. And he can just turn around and walk away from that voice. He must ignore that voice in his head about what is right and what is wrong. It's called your conscience. Now, I recognize, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that is a conscious disregard for human life. It is not that he didn't know. It is that he refused to listen. That's the last part of the last element of the three elements of implied malice. I believe that if you look at the facts in this case, and you can spend an awful lot of time going over all of those lesser included offenses, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you can make this pretty difficult for yourselves. But once I heard a judge say something like there's nothing real hard about this legal stuff, this is something that you should be able to do with your good common sense. You don't need to be a lawyer to do it. We don't entrust it to lawyers. We entrust these final decisions to you, members of the jury. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we have a definition of murder in the second degree. It says that a person was killed unlawfully with malice aforethought. Number one is that beyond any reasonable doubt, Louise Haster is dead. She met her death in the vehicular accident with Mr. Farrell's car on that road on that afternoon. And number two, it is beyond any doubt to be unlawful. There is no reason to think somebody offered an excuse or a justification for what happened for this killing to take place. And finally, we have proven to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that malice of forethought was right there. Ladies and gentlemen, consider the definition of malice of forethought that was previously given to you and find Mr. Farrell guilty of the offenses as charged. Thank you, Your Honor, and ladies and gentlemen of the jury. All right, this is some congressional material for the record. I also wish to thank Dr. Bill Frist. He was in this chamber earlier. He has been an amazing resource. While he is not present now, I know I speak for all of our colleagues in thanking him. He again spoke for all of us in a news conference wherein he was able to answer in very understandable ways many of these complicated questions, so I personally thank him. And I know I speak for everybody in thanking him as well. The challenge facing all of these people and all of us is unprecedented. To a person, every official I have mentioned has responded in the most admirable way. Their poise, their professionalism, their compassion have been a comfort to all of us 
especially to my staff and me. I want to provide an update on where we stand based on Dr. Moritsugu's briefing a few moments ago. It is now 72 hours after this incident occurred, and we now can say we are confident about the health of the public. Beyond the 31 positive nasal swabs I reported yesterday, the results on the nasal swabs analyzed to date have all, and let me emphasize all, come back negative. The CDC has determined no further nasal swabs are needed. Tests on all of the nasal swabs collected on Monday will be completed by the end of today, although we may not be in session. So I chose this moment to come and give you at least this partial report. A total of 278 swabs were taken Monday. At this time, there are no further positive results. So the number of positive results to date remains at 31. Everyone who has tested positive has been notified by medical authorities. Let me put some rumor to rest because it has been circulating all afternoon that some member of the leadership has been provided with a positive test result. The unequivocal clarification in that regard is that story is not true. There is no positive result among any members of Senate leadership. Testing also continues on approximately 1,400 swabs collected Tuesday. Of those, preliminary results on approximately 600 have produced no new positives. To this point, the CDC investigation has established the exposure area as the fifth and sixth floors in the southeast wing of the Hart Building. Based on this determination, the CDC has said no further nasal swabs are needed here. People who were on the fifth and sixth floors in the southeast wing of the Hart Building on Monday are being reminded to complete their full 60-day course of antibiotics, regardless of the result of their nasal swabs. Anyone who entered that area but has not received antibiotics should report to the treatment center at the architect of the Capitol facility on the southeast corner of 6th and East Capitol Streets. A thorough environmental sweep of the Capitol complex began last night. It went on throughout the night and continues today. Those sweeps were conducted by the EPA and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Areas were swept in the Capitol, the Dirksen Senate Office Building, the Ford House Office Building, the Capitol Police Offsite Delivery Center, where all Capitol mail and deliveries go through security screening, and at this time there are no additional results to report. The sweeps will continue, as we reported yesterday, over the next several days of the other areas of the Capitol complex. The entire Capitol complex will be swept, and so there will not be any area left unattended or unchecked before we are cleared. Numerous additional samples have been taken of the ventilation systems, and these samples are under evaluation. I think it is important to emphasize, too, at this time, there is no evidence of contamination in the ventilation system. Because of the extensive work being done, it is not clear when the heart building will reopen, but it will reopen as soon as we are absolutely confident it is completely safe. I want to make one final point. The people who work in these buildings, regardless of their political affiliation, have come to the city and to the Congress because they believe in what this nation represents to its citizens and to the world. Many have made sacrifices to do so. Some are accepting lower pay than they would receive elsewhere. Many are far from their families. All believe that by being here, we can improve the lives of Americans and in the process make America stronger. That letter may have been addressed to me, but these attacks didn't just strike my office. They struck at the heart of that belief. In the past couple days, members of my staff, who have every right to be afraid, who have every right to take some time and be with their loved ones, have come to talk to me. More than one has told me they were more proud than ever to show up for work. This attack was meant to undercut that spirit. What I have seen in the past three days is all I need to know that the attack has missed its mark. I yield the floor.